If you ever wondered what's under the sea, if you ever been excited about D&D underwater, if you ever wanted to go underwater and learn some shit, look at this stuff. Isn't it neat? Wouldn't you think my life is complete? Nay, because I do not know what life exists under the waves, under the ponds, under the swamps. We'll wonder no longer. Welcome back to the lore of Aida. I'm here once again with my co-host, David Carmichael. You know him as C-Mike on the YouTubes. Uh, and we're gonna talk about some underwater stuff. Amazing. Yeah. Or I say, me. We're gonna do the entire episode this like this. this. No, we're not. Uh, absolutely not. Uh, well, welcome back. This is episode two of our little podcast together talking Woo. about lore stuff. Uh, the first one did so well, they let me back into their house. <laughs> uh, let's get right into it. Uh, we're talking. We're talking about underwater specifically. I think we can all kind of bet why we're talking about underwater. Curse of Amity Island out now. Fables D Twenty YouTube. Um, we had some underwater encounters, and you had previously made a video that was all about underwater combat, all about like the terrain shifts, That's making it right, more I interesting. That's right, I did. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I almost didn't know what video you were talking about. <laughs> and you were like, huh? I made a video about this yeah, already? You literally and said And then you're like, me. water, water, combat. I was like, That's right. <laughs> this guy. Uh, so yeah, you made this video. I did. It it gave me some ideas about what we could do, and like you can pause the video now, go check it out. It's great. Link down below. Link in the doobly do. Uh, do people still say that? Yep. Okay, cool. I'm hip. <laughs> um, you got a broken hip. I not yet. We'll see. Uh, so yeah, we dealt with a lot of the the Sahuagin, uh, which I think we said nine different ways on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> or on, on the, I'm pretty on the sure I play. stuck with Showagen half the time. Yeah, I, mean, I was really nervous. Really? About yeah. the Showagen? Oh, God. When we started Amity, I was like... I mean, I was too, dude. Like, <laughs> was like, I think in the first episode, you can see me just go like sit, standing like this, trying not to move. But yeah, that kind of that kind of fear and that kind of stuff, it's it never hit me like in a theater sense. Mm. But... Whenever anyone starts talking about like, oh, this person went in a submarine and they like that entire whatever that the 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 submarine that was in the news recently. Oh yeah, that one freaked me right the hell. I, my knees were buckling, my palms were sweaty. Uh, there was vomit on my sweater already from another thing. From, it's completely unrelated. Uh, but no, like the sea has always terrified me. Yeah, and I don't go to the ocean. Yeah, good. What we're not supposed to be there, right? Yeah, we came from there. We're never going back. No, we climbed out our. I used to know the name of this animal, but I don't anymore. But um, I know what it looks like. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, it's like a thing with kind of legs. <laughs> well, you never <laughs> kinda heard of kind of legs. Yeah, kind of legs. <laughs> but these legs are real nice. Yeah, because they're kind. They're kind. Oh, jeez. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> but okay. We're circling up right now. Uh, the swag, the the schwagen. We'll, we'll just say schwagen because it's schwagen, schwagen, whatever. Sure. Horribly like difficult to say. Really cool villain. Mm -hmm. And I think one of my favorite a and, D and D original a D and D original. One of my favorite moments, and you, it like I did not act. I did not like upcast upcast. I didn't upcast my personality. <laughs> I'm a ninth level, uh, no. <laughs> so I didn't, I didn't like, this wasn't me putting on anything. This wasn't me doing anything. When the Swagan Priestess drops invisibility and you say, there is something that the rain hits that is not there. My reaction of, is 100% real. Because but it paints the perfect picture. Of course. The rain hits something that is not there. Yeah, because you're invisible, but the rain doesn't know that. Yeah. Did it was just so invisible doesn't mean you're not there. Exactly. You are intangible but still there. The rule for invisibility is like everyone always goes to oh you still see their footprints. Yeah, and you can I mean hear you them. you would still see uh smoke move as they run through it. Yeah. You would 
it is it, it, every thing interacts with it except for photons right which i still think photons should interact with it well let me throw you an immediate curveball yeah. if a person goes invisible underwater how does that work because you can technically sense them with like that innate sonar ability yeah like some animals um have. which is most of the underwater creatures yeah so you're only invisible by people who are using their eyes but here's the thing about being underwater mm -hmm. you can only see uh, up to 30 feet away. Okay. Dark vision is only up to 60 feet. What's dark vision? Uh, this old thing that doesn't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. um, well, if you use a light spell, yeah. it's only up to 60 feet because w light gets lost the denser and dark deeper you go. Yeah. And then I think, yeah, you covered that in that video, which you should definitely check out now. Uh, but like, yeah, the, the pressure as well. Is mm -hmm. what affects that too, which would I we mean, didn't really play with too much. We didn't go down that far, I don't think. I think where we did go deep, it wasn't the bottom of the ocean deep. It was like basic diving deep. Yeah, like yeah, I, I was fully in that. I think it was even we in, never went past a hundred feet deep. No, because it was the the floating island. We we can talk as if the thing is out. yeah, because it's coming out okay. after. Okay, cool. Um, we. The floating island is maybe 60 to 80 feet deep. Cause that's 60 to 80, uh, six to eight stories down. Yeah. Which is still a lot. It's deep for yeah. sure. Yeah. I, yeah. Cause we didn't really play with pressure. We did, we did do a little bit of like exploration that we just kind of like went past because I think you were using the underworld clock at that point. And then, yeah. Which was actually slowing us down when we only had so much time to play. I mean, yeah, but you did it in a way which didn't feel like you were like steamrolling or railroading, which was great. Yeah. But yeah, the uh, again, the underwater combat oh, dude, stuff. The seaweed. Yeah. You always seaweed. feel like someone's watching you. Terrifying. When uh, Shahan Madi's cloak is made of seaweed that can make him disguised as a shamble in mm -hmm. the seaweed. Yeah. So he's just watching you as you guys enter the lair. Yeah. And it's like, yeah. Like this is the same thing with dragons, the same thing that everybody on the fucking internet says when you're fighting legendary creatures. When you enter their lair, they know you're there. Yeah. Unless you have explicitly done the prep work at the table to, to find ways to make sure the bosses don't know you're coming. Yeah. Yeah, and especially underwater too, because there is that, that thing where sound travels further. Mm -hmm. Which is, you know, like, uh, thunder wave will go twice as yeah. far. And th th I think in your video, you say even thunder damage is doubled. I th it's one of the other, I know lightning is doubled. Yeah. But thunder, I think it's just further. Ah. I think that keeps it simple, but they can be both. Right. I just got to pick one next time we're underwater. Okay. Uh, you did do a lot of world building in the beginning of, of the adventure of Amity and then in the book of Amity, which will be coming out. Uh, of the differences between the Western Sea and the Bukinawa Sea. Or no, that, they're the same thing. Yeah, the Western, <laughs> the Western Sea is the Bukinawa Sea. sea and then the Trading Sea is the Eastern Sea. Mm -hmm. um, no, no, no. The Trading Sea is the Central Sea, uh -huh. which makes up the Mediterranean. The right. Eastern Sea is on the other side of the Eastlands and the Eastland Mountains oh, that okay. are south of the White Sea. Gotcha. Uh, then there is the Western Sea, which is Bukinawa Sea, which goes up to the Frozen Sea, and then further down, we'll go to the Umberley Sea. Okay. This is potentially going to derail us, this question, but I'm here to do this. So here we go. Is the map of Ada that we have right now complete? Landmass wise, yes. Okay. So they are ostensibly in the cosmology. Because I have a summer yes. and a winter for first dawn and a mm -hmm. summer and a winter for second dawn so keeping that in mind because you do use a polar system mm -hmm. with the north and the south the map that we have is a a relative like of the entire world the entire planet would you say that's correct yes okay so i'm i i i am always curious about these things because maps much like victories and histories are always told by the victors or told by the first people who were there 
So whenever I'm presented with a map, I'm like, is this correct? Or is this an approximation of whoever told us the story of what's correct? Because I'm imagining there's probably some islands in the Western and Eastern Sea, and maybe some of the trading seas. That are off the edge. That are off the edge or are undiscovered yet. Well, when you think about the planet, right? This gets really scientific quick. If you take the map and you start wrapping it to be a planet, yeah. that's a small fucking planet. Yeah. And uh, it's not that small. Yeah. There's a lot more ocean. But so there's more ocean? There's more ocean. There's more ocean. There's more ocean? <laughs> <laughs> Please tell me, tell me more about the ocean. So you know there's more ocean on the other side? Why? Are there dinosaurs there? No, those in the Southland. Okay. Are there really dinosaurs? In the <laughs> They're in the Southland. Oh, cool. <laughs> there's, a, there's literally a jungle that's uh, run by lizard folk who tame dinosaurs. So when you go there, you know, like there are bronchosauruses with huts on the back. There oh. are dinosaur races, T-Rex hunting. Yeah. A lot of the stuff from like Chalt in Forgotten Realms. I guess. Oh, God, man. <laughs> Read a book. <laughs> hey, if you like this, consider subscribing. And of course, if you have any burning questions about the world of Aida that you want answered from the source themselves, drop it in the comments below. Uh, so like, bring it back to the underwater thing. So there's, in addition to the sea dragons, to the massive, you know, armies of Schwagen and merfolk, there is potentially underwater Dinosaurs too? Yeah. Like Leopleurodons mm-hmm. and, and such? I just didn't have the mini for the game. Okay. But also, that'd be such a derail. Yeah, of <laughs> course. So just like, there's a massive Leopleurodon. Yeah, we don't need that right now. No. Uh, yeah, there's, there's a handful of those. I would say there's that. You have the Shawagan. Mm-hmm. We have giant crabs. Yep. Uh, giant animal, just like there are the giant beasts, there are giant beasts underwater. Right. Um, we have the, what did we call them? The, the, the fish? We said, we called them in the game like scuttlefish or something. The scuttlebugs? The scuttlebugs. Yeah. Yeah, we called, that's what they are now. Oh, God. <laughs> um, we have the bronze dragons. Right. Uh, we, which just are the oceanic dragons. Right. Which are purple lightning, green eyes, and uh, who battle off giant sharks and megalodons that uh, are sensitive to electricity. Mm. So if you you guys never went for it, but all the Shawagan have a vulnerability to electricity because they're shark people. In and out of water? Yes, because a shark's uh, pores basically uh-huh. around their nose is hypersensitive to electromagnetic fields. Oh. So let me ask you then, <clears throat> when- And then we have mer, uh, marrow, we have marrows. Yep. Uh, which are just merfolk. Right. Uh, the Shawagan worship Sekula, the sh- two-headed shark god, which is Forgotten Realms straight out of it. Mm-hmm. Um, if Sekula starts showing up, I would have to like earn more lore details. Lore. It's basically shark worshiping people and there's a, a super mega shark god. That's great. And then you have Mero, who are essentially mermaids and merfolk, mm-hmm. who have, by and large, like Davy Jones tentacles going on. Um, and they're hungry for treasure mm. all the time. And they worship uh, Umberly, the Kraken. Yeah. And... Then you have the water genasi, okay, whose res- cultural responsibility has been maintaining the oceanic currents and uh, cycle of water, working with the air genasi and the earth and the fire. Mm. There, as we touched on a previous episode, there are no demi planes or, or, or planes of existence outside of this one. There but- are the mirror w- worlds. But there's no like plane of water. No, for example. there are not. Yeah. There are no elemental planes. Gotcha. So like with that, all the nastiness that would be in there, just in our world now. They exist in just the places where they could exist. Right. My my one thing is, uh, so you said that uh, Umberly 
Umberly. My, my favorite lady. Uh, is a kraken now? Mm-hmm. She, she, in my mind, resembles more of Ursula, an mm-hmm. embodiment of Ursula mm-hmm. from Little Mermaid than whatever Forgotten Realms writes. Mm. It's just this nasty queen witch from the sea. She is also the kraken. She is the Kraken. The Kraken. Um, do you do you do you have Abolaths in this world? I've thought about them. They definitely would be deep sea monsters. Because um, even in Forgotten Realm, even though they're like alien, they are aquatic. Mm-hmm. I I don't I haven't messed with them because they're very psionic based, mm-hmm. and I've kept a lot of psionic at arm's length because there's so much more than mind powers that just got to get filled in first. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I've i always liked the idea that Aboleth exist in the areas of the ocean that are too deep or possibly that open up into areas that are flooded under dark. And so unless you are... Ooh, I like that. Yeah, unless you are physically going down there and braving the deep, deep pressure or you hit a pocket when you're in the underdark that you flood. They're basically the bell rogs of the sea. They really are. Yeah. Yeah. And like, especially with their kind of like the, the mucusy bits of it, like they are those like very deep, deep predators that like after a certain depth, like nothing exists but them. Like. And potentially umberly. And potentially umberly. And they don't screw with her. Yeah. So, yeah. There's, there's also Bukanawa, who's technically in the sea. Mm-hmm. Um, who is a, a... What now? I thought he was... I thought they were sealed. It's the Bukanawa there's, Sea. The Bukanawa is sealed in the sea. Okay. So, but technically, Bukanawa is in the sea. Okay. Just the Bukanawa Sea. Okay. Serpent dragon, who ate the moons. Then there is... Oh, man, I cannot remember the pronunciation of the name... Tom Banano Kano. Tom Banano Kano. Mm-hmm. So big T. Big T. Uh, Tom big Banano tea. Kano. Uh, giant crab that rises the tide. It, like, it's a, a folklore explaining why the tides are a thing. Yeah, basically. Okay. But because it's a fantasy world, it does exist out there. Right. And it's probably more of a ancient patron for warlocks mm-hmm. than it is anything else. Same thing like Bukanawa. Now, if you're going to bump into Bukanawa... You, there are s- certain checkboxes that have to happen within the party and the adventure <laughs> to get to that point. What are those checkboxes? Mm. <laughs> Must have moon. Uh, you need a, dru- a moon druid for a bait. moon druid, okay. You moon. need an ancient patron warlock. Ooh. And you need a almost entirely sea-based adventure. Mm. Would have been great if we had one of those. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I, who, who's to say? Who's to say in this this lore, uh, lore of Aed? Aed uh, what? Cat, what? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> who's to say in this lore video? Are uh, we recording? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> who's to say that there might be a, a follow-up? Maybe sometime in the future. Who's who to say? Who's to say? Maybe after Amity Island. Well, honestly, if you guys would have failed at the end of Amity Island, which was a good chance of it. Yeah. Um, I, I, if you failed hard enough, <laughs> that would have been the end of the second dot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, are we allowed to know what they were trying to summon or is that still going to be... We'll talk about that in a video about them. Okay. Let's stick to the ocean. The ocean. So, with Bukanawa, with Big T, uh, which is what I'm going to call them, um, you can have the pronunciation right here. Tambana no Kano. This great deity aside, what was the influence? Like, why did you decide to use, like, Filipino, like, folklore for that, specifically? Because you use that for not only that character, I think for Bukanawa, and then for both the Storm... Storm Queen and Sea Lord as well? Uh, well, we really haven't dived into them. Yeah. So I'm not going to, I haven't locked those in. Okay. Because there's so much going on in the ocean. The ocean is so big that it's like until we have adventures, mm-hmm. nothing is too locked into stone. They're kind of like 
easing in and out like the tide. Like the tide. Uh, whereas my Paylor, spelled differently, mm -hmm. is based off the sun deity in Filipino lore. You know what? This is why. Whoa. We're getting a first-hand look. He's going to his mini closet. Oh, what's this book? So I, I got this book for Christmas. The Islands of Sinauna, mm -hmm. which is made by uh, a group of Filipino creators. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I want to have aspects of my world that shine in everyone's eyes mm. and that everyone uh, can go to. And, you know, just as much as I will take water deep and make it my own. Mm -hmm. or Dracula, or Nordic mythology, mm -hmm. or uh, South American mythology. Like, this is an opportunity to learn about other culture right. and try to make my world a little bit less just my experience. Mm. And as a person who hates the ocean, that's really great. <laughs> <laughs> so the uh, uh, another Filipino lore is we have those mythical creatures. We have Pelor is based off the sun god in here mm -hmm. versus Pelor in Forgotten Realms. So Lune is based off the moon in here, oh. um, as well as her sisters. And then... Uh, so Lune has sisters? Yeah, they're all gone. Oh, the, the other moons. And then um, we have the three gods of death are based off this book. Wow. So thank you, whoever published the Islands of Sina Uh Hit Point Press. Oh, okay. Thank you to our Indiegogo backers for believing in us. Oh, cool. Independent me. Yeah, it was really great to support independent creators. I think it's important to to bring in that level of like things that you you don't understand or you don't have a like uh, a basin, especially with a culture uh, like an island culture that would that would look at the sea as it is. It is this I am vast like thing of yeah. life and death at the same time. I am farm born. I am not <laughs> <laughs> using your own background. <laughs> yeah, I am farm born. I am not. Oh my god, uh, we're both farm born. Are we both farm born? Yeah. See, there's limited experience there. Oh boy. And then the Eastlands, I use uh, the Crescent Moon, uh, not Crescent Moon, the Crescent City uh, expansion series. Mm -hmm. Uh, for the Southlands, I use Cobalt Press's Southland. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and nice. those are—that's the groundwork for me to have a world from different perspectives. Because I remember Sly Flourish once said, "Was like, why make your stuff up from scratch when companies spend thousands of dollars on a forty-dollar product for right. you to use?" And it's like, yeah, you're right. Collect the best ideas, and then over time, when you need to make it your own, make it your own. Yeah. Yeah. So with that in mind, there's there's obviously we have these holdovers from uh, Forgotten Realms, the Swagon, the Merfolk. Uh, I mean, the Bronze Dragon technically is before that, but whatever. Do you imagine there's other unexplored civilizations that we just have not seen? Oh, yeah. The Water Genasi. I've, I've had daydreams about Water Genasi. Shout out Hooper. Shout uh, out to Hooper, yeah. Uh, caustic waves for their shadows. Yeah, dark blue skin with like sh tiger shark stripes from different shades from light to dark to different colors. Webbed toes with slightly webbed feet. Uh, sorry, webbed fingers. And, and webbed toes. And webbed toes. Yeah. Water Genasi are not half genie as, mm -hmm. as they are in Forgotten Realms. Uh, the genies were made by the Genasi. What? Yeah. Flip that on its head. <laughs> the genies were made by the Genasi? Mm-hmm. All right. How? <laughs> so we'll stick to water Genasi since it's the oceanic yeah. video. Um, you can't it, drop that on me and expect me to move on. And so the genies are very much the, the kings or the sultans. Okay. This was how the elementals uh, won 
the war against the dragons in the Age of Wrath is by creating the genies mm -hmm. who are this like spiritual public leader who is whose power comes from their people. Okay. Right? So as long as uh, the water genasi exists, so do their genies and their power. And when you kill a genie, a scion takes the place of the next genie. So someone is born, there is always a water genasi who is born who will become the next genie. Interesting. Do they possess the same level of powers as they do in other media? Like mm -hmm. they are granting wishes, that kind of thing. Super powerful. But that power comes from the genasi existing who are the manifestations of Aeda. Right. And so culturally, the, the genie's purpose is to protect the, the way that the ocean works. And so whereas in the Forgotten Realms where a marriage might be like very like evil in some aspects, these are benevolent in some way, neutral, kind neutral. of neutral. Uh, they do what works for them. Mm. Like if you think about classic, the classic idea of an emperor, the right. emperor is supposed to be the pinnacle point of the society and people. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, they represent all the people and all the people go back. It's supposed to be a symbiotic relationship, right. but the fall of men is that, you know, humans are power hungry. Yeah. So it's like a genie could enslave their people, but their people have to be at that point gaslit and brainwashed to give that genie power over them. Hey, we make for a great story. Sounds like good stories. Yeah. The I've I have images in my mind that like uh, a water genasi when they swim, it looks like a mermaid swimming. Mm. But it's just the water around their legs that look like a fin. Mm. That's cool. Yeah. Do you do you know you you're familiar with Kuatoa, I'm assuming. Kuatoa. Kuatoa are the fish-headed kind of like oh, very, the little fish boys. The little fish boys, but they're like their main broken thing in the Forgotten Realms is if they believe in something hard enough, it becomes a deity. That's crazy. Yeah. So I'm assuming they're not in Aida. I mean, little fish people. Yeah, they are. Yeah. I didn't know that about their lore. Yeah. It's a little op. <laughs> well, it's great because I think uh, Runesmith did a video that's like in his typical deadpan style. It's like if they pray enough to a grilled cheese sandwich, that grilled cheese sandwich becomes their god. And they like, would probably worship the genie. They uh, that's yeah. easily because well, the genie is the lord of the territory. Right. Um, yeah. So it's interesting that like there is a. There, it's all factions too. Yeah. There so are, like the the Shawagan are are very the barb. Barbarian wildlings of the sea. They're nomads, essentially. Yeah. Kind of like sharks. Sharks have to keep moving. You gotta keep to moving. Be, yeah. And so uh, the water genasi and the shawagan have a long history of of violence. Right. And then Marrows, them too. When they claim the, fa the, the treasures of a fallen ship, no one gets in there. Right. Have you ever considered like having a entire campaign be underwater? Oh yeah. Of like you can only play these classes, or like you have to have some sort of like built-in like kind of Sandy Cheeks way of being in Bikini Bottom. You know, like right. You have a you have a base, you have a suit that you can go mm -hmm. out. Yada yada. I've thought about it. it uh, Amity Island almost went that direction at a point, and I was like, oh great, I don't have the minis for that. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it's totally doable because it's just, I think it's gotta be the game that the players wanna play. Yeah. And then I can lock that world building in based off all these ideas I have. Mm -hmm. So with that in mind, bringing it back to, to Amity, we, we did experience kind of the uh, lore aspect of that where there was like a bit of, uh, there was a temple in the Shawagan base underneath the lighthouse mm -hmm. that had some depictions of that. Um, and because now that we've learned that there is this cycle of um, uh, like winter and summer and everything, uh, is there anything that like could exist kind of like an Atlantis style where like there was something involved in the... Oh, absolutely. The, and there probably is. is. The world is at Amity's point known to the to 
the best historian is that it's like I don't know, almost like 150 to 200,000 years old. Yeah. The, to the best historian, that's the known age of the world. Jeez. <laughs> and that's that's because like, it's as far back as any cultural like paper trail can go. Right. And what a what a what better a place than to preserve something from the ages long past where no one will go except the people who can go underwater. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or or those who trap it in the sea. Or, or in the trapped. ice, I should say. In the ice. Because that's what we find out in uh, Lost Minds of Colossus. Yeah. Is there's worlds under ice. Yeah. And that ice, if you look at the, the frozen map, expands to almost yeah a whole nother continent size. Mm. So for if you're a family born on the edge of the ice, the next decade of your life, this is my home. And then the season <laughs> changes, your home is melting away. Yeah. Man. I, I've always been terrified of the ocean just because like, obviously the last- Dragons. Be, well, <laughs> 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 I knew from a very early age that there were dragons. No, I mean, it, it goes back, uh, tying it back to dragons, it goes back to that old nautical map of here there be dragons. There is so much about that world that we just don't know, and we probably won't. Like, I, I don't remember the exact statistic, but it's something astronomically low that we've mapped the ocean. But yeah, there'd be like Atlantis, there'd be lost cities okay. to time. It, There's just, a lot of ocean out there. There is a lot of ocean. Not not so much in our world, but I, I think like it, it's a state. In Aida. There's a lot of ocean. There's a lot of ocean in Aida. Uh, it, it doesn't happen so much in our world. Uh, I mean, so far as we know. But I, I feel like it's a, it is a staple in a and d game for there to be the the past. The past is, is ancient, but it is more prophetic and more technologically advanced. I, in a lot of fantasies lately, they've been doing that. Yeah. Because it's a good twist on what has come before that. Yeah. Which is just old times. And then now it's old times was made by advanced civilizations. Um, I, I don't disagree. I feel like when we look at Rome. Mm -hmm. uh, if Guys, the, we're talking about the Roman Empire. If you're listening to this, you're a good swell person. Yeah. <laughs> um... <laughs> If they had a, a, you know, another decade, uh, we could have had engines, because they were working on steam power. Really? Yeah. Hmm. If they had another decade, they would have entered a completely different type of industrial revolution. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but they did not. They did not. <laughs> so it's like, if a civilization exists long enough, and ha whatever the means pushes innovation they can unlock things that then become lost to time. Mm. Look at the Age of Thunder. They created constructs. Yeah. Using the souls of elementals. Uh, Compare that with Bryn and her father was just like, we can enchant items. Yeah. You get but plus one. But that's 12,000 years difference. Yeah. Um, and constructs, they don't get made anymore. No. Because if you did, a, a Janasi would put an end to it. Really? Oh, yeah. Oh, because it has a soul in it. Because it, they they were made with elemental souls. Janasi souls. Do you... So... Which leads to the elemental monsters. Right. Which are all curses. What? So, in like, the reason you would fight a water elemental monster mm -hmm. is because uh, a water Janasi died... And there, a spiritual, like, goodbye was not done. And so their soul morphs their body into an elemental monster that wreaks havoc. So if a enterprising young mage, they wanted to unleash a massive amount of water, uh, water elementals, as they would commit an atrocity in a water genasi village, and then all that unresolved pain would turn into an water army. elemental monsters. And I want to give you ideas, but... Not, it has... They're not... Genasis aren't ruling the world. That's true. So something 
knock them down. Something did. I would call those the giants. The gi <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> We're bigger than you. Are there water giants? Uh, not yet. Not yet. Probably not. Um, I, if they were, I would, they would be part like the mythical creatures. Mm-hmm. Like Bakanawa would be a water giant, but mm -hmm. it would just be a mythical monster. Because from, from what you've said and kind of from what we've already been discussing, like the ocean seems like a great place in the Age of Thunder and the Age of Wrath, where like if I was a low level person or if I was just like not wanting to get eaten or smashed, like that's where I'd go. They wouldn't though, because in Primordial Age, life for the Genasi on average was like 16, 17 years. Wow. Of just like danger? Just danger. Because there were no genies. Right. That means there were no greater societies working together to create power. Mm. They were scattered among small clans, which means they had no power. It's kind of the whole like uh, the newer, the Matt Reeves Planet of the Apes, where he's like one stick break, but many sticks stick oh, together. Oh God, thing. yeah. Yeah. That was Matt Reeves? That was Matt Reeves. Oh. Yeah, that's the ocean. The ocean. It's dangerous. Genasi are uh -huh. part of it. It's a massive thing. The relationship with the ocean and the sky are very important. So that leads mm. to, you know, air Genasi, which is, oh man, I can't wait. <laughs> They're up there right now. Yeah. They, uh, the cities are made of clouds and they ride clouds like they, uh, like they were surfing. I'm picturing uh, the Disney's Tarzan. Very much. With the Phil yeah. Collins soundtrack. All you have to do is like get on an airplane and be above the clouds and yeah. you just see islands of clouds. Yeah. Those are homes. And then you just see one rad dude just going, Woo! two hearts, one family. But yeah, that's the, that's the sky. Back uh, to the ocean. Back to the <laughs> so we're back in the ocean. Um, do you think that there, so we have like these massive oceans, obviously the Western. The trading, trading. sea is the most developed. Right. Are, do you have any like large lakes and like, is there any structural difference between like salt water and fresh water in your, in your world of like, can a marrow only exist in salt water? Yeah. So, um, marrow, I think the water genasi, marrows can only be in salt water. Mm-hmm. Uh, water genasi can be an either, but it takes like, it takes time mm -hmm. because if you're a saltwater genasi, moving to a freshwater place is very like a big ask. Yeah. Uh, their kids will be fine in the salt, in the freshwater. Mm -hmm. Um, as much as the bronze dragon is the dragon of the saltwater, uh, the golden dragon is the the dragon of freshwater. Hmm. So it's a river dragon, a lake dragon. Interesting. And then Shawagan, like salmon, can go back and forth. That was my thought. Which makes like, them yeah. so much worse as a villain. That they, <laughs> they're so adaptable so quickly but it's because they're so destructive of everything that nothing, if if they were able to build, to conquer and build society, mm -hmm. it wouldn't last. They're, they're too destructive. Yeah. They're like a shark. You always have to keep moving, always got to keep eating. And so it's like, yeah, they wouldn't even be able to rule the world because it wouldn't be enough. Right. It, it's super interesting too because I'm now I'm picturing like a riverboat or something like that mm. in the middle of the night they climb up and kind of like creature from the black lagoon I, kind of thing. So alternative ending of Amity Island. Yeah. I was so happy if you guys went this direction. If you so when you guys got to choose the lighthouse or the ship. Yeah. You chose the ship. It'd have been so crazy. Oh yeah. Because the ship would sink eventually because the sharks would break into the hull. Mm hmm. And then the shawa and then there is a dinghy you guys can escape with, but the shawagan would chase you down in the dinghy and pull the dinghy down. Oh yeah. Yeah. I would have you would have seen me go, no. <laughs> Stay off the no. boat. Stay off the boat. At that point you, you gotta jump in. Like you, you can't you can, you know the, the I think they did the image really well in uh uh um, Ghost of Salt Marsh. Uh Aquaman? 
when oh, he dives yeah. in the ocean and the <laughs> lightning flip, not. and there's like millions of there. Oh no, that so that that is what it, that those things. I think they're called the deep or whatever they're called or the so trench or something. Deep, deep ones, Shawagan, yeah, uh, sea devils. They all come from the same lore. They are the uh, the Lovecraftian fish monster. They are the uh, creature from the deep lagoon. Mm-hmm. They're all the same lore. They're just fish people. They're just monstrous fish people. Right. The because uh, sharks. Because sharks, <laughs> which are beautiful animals. They are beautiful, and they're not inherently vicious. Like. No, they're actually more curious, and they just yeah. happen to be always curious with teeth. They just have resting murder face. Let's be honest. Actually, that that resting murder face only exists because we have slow motion cameras and we always film them jumping out of the water to oh. eat an animal. And they're just ah, uh. <laughs> please, 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 come on. <laughs> God, in in Amity, too, you made the sharks the most brutal thing. They were the least modified monster from the monster manual. What? Yeah. <laughs> that shark did like 40 damage in a single hit. Yeah, that's a giant shark. Oh. <laughs> you almost ate my boy. I almost ate Brent. Dude, when you and Trace were like, you and Jordy. <laughs> yeah, me and, me and Jordy. <laughs> we're like, can we take the damage, please? We don't want, like, it's almost like the, like stereotypical like men trying to protect the woman kind of moment. That's exactly what it was. <laughs> and it was just like, no guys, the shark attacks. Yeah. That's how brutal it is. Yeah. Well, then at the end, too, well, he got down to two death saves. Mm-hmm. And then, like, barely barely got out of there. It was the most Jaws part of the game. It very much was. <laughs> yeah. And, and, like, we... we I don't know if we're going to have this video to talk about it, but we're in the underwater section. I think that you did a very good job of taking Jaws as it was and making that threat seem real because... In the movie Jaws, we never see the we don't, we don't see the monster for a very long time, and you kind of flip that on its head, where we saw the swagon immediately, and you're cool, you're like cool, that's a shark monster, and then there was this other guy who we like heard rumors of, and we never fully saw him until the end of the game, and I was just like sitting there after like a week later, and I was like, Jormund is the shark. That it doesn't matter. Like the actual shark didn't matter because he was that the entire time. Anyway, that was a slight diversion from our ocean theme. Um, I mean, yes and no, because Curse of Amity Island is aquatic based. Right. It's coastal based. Right. You get yeah. you get an inspiration for that, by the way. Oh, thanks. You're welcome. Don't use that ever in our game. Uh, <laughs> Next um, game. So, guys. I'm gonna, no! Chris gave me this. And everyone's gonna look at you with dead eyes. And then I'm going to <laughs> poop my pants because it's probably gonna be me who's gonna be dealing with it. Let me look over my notes. Do you have anything for like swamps? Like, is there anything different for, like, obviously they are much more shallow. Yeah. So swamps and bogs, we have uh, black dragons. That's okay. a big thing. A lot of everything makes a lot of sense once you understand dragons in Aida. It all starts with dragon. It kind of does. Then you throw some dungeons. And an and. <laughs> Just a big ampersand. <laughs> Why are we going in loops? So swamps, I always... All swamps are acidic and poisonous. Okay. In a swamp, you are likely to bump into green dragons, black dragons, and hags. Yeah. The water is toxic. Lizard folk who morph into alligators. Um, what? Lizard folk turn into alligators. Since when? Go read up the monster manual. Okay, go ahead. (laughs) As a bonus action, they become a crocodile, basically. You have, oh, what are they called? Smots? Swats? Swits? What are you trying to say? They are the big fat alligator people. They're very deadly. I've never heard of Dean, these people. I'm going to open up my Swats? my D&D app. I thought you were talking about like the toad people. And those are slods. Slods. Toad. Yeah. yeah. They're toads. Yeah. Uh, they're in swamps. And they're very, yeah. they're uh, freshwater based. Oh. Very, a very druidic ranger-esque society. Mm-hmm. 
whereas lizard folk are very fighter and rogue based. Mm -hmm. And then you have the blue dragon, not the blue dragons, the gold dragons. Rivers. Yeah, freshwater is a lot less dangerous. I, I unless when you <laughs> unless you find clugs of it. Yeah. And then you're like, there's monsters here. I really I literally wrote down stay away from swamps. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's like cool. I'm not doing I'm not going there. Like we gotta go retreat. Also that there's thing. carnivorous plants in swamps. Yeah. Do you want a swamp fact I learned recently? Give me it. Bogs are considered acidic. Fens are alkaline. That's the reason. There's two different words. So the swamps are corrupted by blight and chaos typically by a dragon. And then it's kind of a, a footprint, right? Mm -hmm. But that chaos and corruption draw hags and then hags take over. Mm -hmm. And then hags are inherently, they have, uh, they often hold the veil to the wild and the fae. And so you get start getting crazy crap happening to the plant life around bogs too. That's why there are very few people who live in the bog. Yeah. Growing up, there was a uh, there was a monster movie that I was, was there. <laughs> growing up, I had one movie. Uh, it was a monster movie called uh, The Legend of Boggy Creek, and it was this kind of found footage. It was like early '70s, I think, and it was this thing that always terrified me, and it was this boogeyman swamp monster that always followed this creek and so the the line tag was it's always it always follows the creek and i always was terrified of this thing because the way that they described it and kind of the way you're describing uh freshwater swagen is they can attack and they're going to go and they can go upstream or downstream you have no idea and you can't catch them in the water and to me it's like the water is like a life-giving, like we all need the water to survive. And like, if it's a fresh running creek or stream or river, like you can always kind of put in your mind, like, oh, everything will go from here and go that way. And the idea that something could patrol those and not only get in and out of the water, but move in the water much faster than you could ever possibly move terrifies me to this day. <laughs> it, it's like it, it kind of speaks to why how important you know water freshwater genasis are which yeah. are more green with blue stripes mm. uh, so water genasi are very valuable they're very rare because what they are right so an adventurer who's uh a genasi is somebody who's probably someone who's disconnected from their family and community for some reason mm -hmm. and they're figuring something out solid community means no one needs to go anywhere. Yeah. Adventurers are people who go everywhere. Who so literally do not have a home. Explicitly, yeah. Yeah. So it's like, unless you're in your home and you're solving your home problem like Bryn or Meridian. Right. Yeah. Or someone's forcing you to solve your problems that you've run away from. Yeah. So in that in that essence, uh, because I, we haven't talked about it on, on camera, we talked about it off camera quite a bit, uh, my backup character, the original character I wanted to play before I made Halleck, was a water genasi paladin. Yeah. Yeah. And I now that I'm like talking about this, I'm like, ooh, that would have been a bundle of problems. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I was like, yeah, hey, you really want to play that? Let's yeah. do that. <laughs> do you want to? Cool. Yeah. Especially now that I've changed the, uh, I've worked on the classes. Right. It works a little bit better. So yeah, a paladin, Genasi would have been great because I was ready to have like a local scion show up to be like, we got a problem. We got a societal war problem right now. Really? Yeah. This faction is a problem. Uh, we we hear that they are summoning something. So they were gonna be, there was another there was gonna be another Genasi that showed up. Mm-hmm. Wow. So following up on that, so that then this this but, wagon... it, but it wasn't a. A, a crucial part of the plot to like, oh, we should bring in Genasi world building. Like, no, uh, that's not crucial to the world building. So we'll keep this isolated a bit more. So in that sense, the the area of around Amity. So Hooper wasn't just doing his job is based on what you've just said of like, they are the natural protectors of the order of the world. 
Hooper should have known about the Swagen and their plan if he is connected to that, or because the dragon was subjugated in that sense. Yeah, but he's also, this is a complex part, the town doesn't have a cleric. So, well, he, so he has to... Yeah. The town's <laughs> cleric stepped away from divine work. Like, uh, the, jo the role of a priest in any religion is a uh, a counselor. Right. The cleric in Amity stepped away and focused on politics. And other things. <laughs> and towers. <laughs> towers. Politics and towers. And that responsibility of being a counselor for people fell on the, the Genasi Druid, who lived there long enough that it was like, welcomed you to the island, welcomed Halleck to the island. Mm. It's like, hey, you should be here. Which is a question of uh, understanding fate. Mm. Like, hey, you should be here. You just, you need it. Hi, I need you to die. So it's like, yeah, he may have known that the dragon, it's not, something's not right about the dragon. Mm. Might not know exactly what, but hey, the dragon's not been right around here and it's supposed to be here and everything's supposed to work right. Mm. How many times has Hooper went off into the mines and went through the underwater tunnels? Zero, that we know of. That we know of. But if you think about it, how long he's been there, mm. like he's investigated. He's done his druidic duty. Right. <laughs> um, and the dragon is not a foe he can face. Right. There are children on the island. Yeah. There, and there's families. And it's like, I'm stuck on this island. What am I going to do? Mm. I got, he picked his priorities. It's the analogy of the lighthouse keeper, kind mm -hmm. of, yeah. But on a, like, supernatural level. Yeah. Going back to the ocean, uh, some amount mm -hmm. of Ada's moons have been eaten. By Bukanawa. Have been uh, destroyed. We, 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 we can only believe what the, the internal lore that we know. That Bukanawa ate them. It was it was six, and then it was seven. There was a number that shifted based on who was telling the story. Hooper said the number. Hooper said six. Hooper said nine. Hooper said nine. And then Taco tried to correct me and say six. And say six. But then Hooper said nine and because the original person who said six was her uncle Marlin. Mm hmm. So that, who's just a halfling? Who's just a halfling sailor? Yeah. Who, what the heck does he know? So there were nine moons that have been eaten. There were a total of nine. Eight have been eaten. Eight have been eaten. So the remaining moon is Salune. Uh, this is going to get s super dumb, and I apologize. Yeah. What does that do to a tidal structure? A tile? The tide. The tide? A lot. Yeah. Um, you could. Uh, not even just the tide, like if there's a lot of moons, they can balance out like a dance on what the sea does, mm -hmm. what the land does, what time does. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of what we as people in the real world base time off of is the moon cycle. That was the original agricultural time tracker. If we have eight of those, what does that mean? Um, what monsters are associated to the moon that... Uh, that were around a lot of the time that are now only here one week out of the month. Harpies. Werewolves. Werewolves. So what, I mean... Were, was the sea a safer place? Because... Was, oh, yeah. Was was Bukanawa devouring the moons not only to... Like, is it... Bukanawa is a, is a worm? A, a female? Uh, I believe Bukanawa is a they... Oh. That I wrote down? Let me... I'm on the page. Bukanawa. Please. I right, reference Bukanawa as a they. Okay. So Bukanawa essentially either devoured or saved. Basically. Oh, sorry. Bukanawa is a she. That's what I thought. Yeah, Bukanawa is a she. Okay. So she, our glorious lady, uh, <laughs> either saved or subjugated this entire thing to only one lunar cycle. Mm -hmm. it, like... The tides being one thing is another thing, but also like how 
how the ocean as a, as a whole is affected by the moons when there are eight mm-hmm. is super nine. fascinating. Yes, when there are nine. It's super fascinating to me because there is, like, especially because the the water genasi are, are, are together and are creating these kind of civilizations. And we're here before the moon. Exactly. And it was a very dangerous place. Right. So that would lead me to believe if all of these beings came together and banished Bukanawa to the Western Sea. What the hell was the training scene like before that? Terrifying. Like, like you can't go on water. Like, Terr- you literally cannot go on water. You, there, there was no concept of going on. Yeah. You're in or out. So sailing in, in like, so... It, sailing began in the age of, I forget the name of it, but the moon age, where the moon first came, which is right after the wrath. Right. Which is when elves showed up. <laughs> on boats. Elves showed up with the moons. What? Yeah. You keep you keep throwing these little <laughs> things in here like, yeah, they made the sun. Or yeah, they came with the moons. Like yeah. what? Yeah. The el like the elves brought the moons? I don't know. Do you oh yes. This is I no no. I don't know. I, don't I have know. not answered this question. What brought the moons? What brought the moons? Elves. But I do know. That during the dark sky is mm-hmm. when the moon, which is the the age right after the moon okay. and right before first dawn, is when the moons got destroyed or devoured or whatever. Or however they were lost. Yeah. And then we found out that they are somewhere else now. We did? Uh, we are in the umbral, so. Yeah. This, this in will, umbral, there it, are. There are eight moons. Mm-hmm. And if there were nine, and eight were devoured, they're in the umbral then. Yes. Okay. So we figured out, guys. We we, <laughs> we figured something out on this show. <laughs> Our first thing that we've done: Bukanawa devoured eight moons in the prime material, and they were sent to the umbral. What does that mean? Who knows? And there were eight dark lords. There were eight dark lords. We, in the umbral, I'm we assuming. talked about this. In we 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 were oh, all. Oh, it's right. In the did. haunting of Ruby Mil- Minnie's Inn. <laughs> you <laughs> fucked it up yourself. <laughs> the haunting of Ruby Minnie's Inn. Yes. We talked about there were eight dark lords. Yes. And there were eight moons in the umbral. Yes. Um. Yes. God, what a terrifying place that's going to be like. And uh, the moon, a full moon, was when the Yellow King was being summoned at the end of Curse of Amity Island. Right. God. Uh, again, I want to go into that, but I know we're going to stick in the underwater stuff. Uh, and what what a poetic thing, also, to have that final ritual be underwater in a presumed temple to Bukanawa. Crazy. It's like you planned this stuff. Gosh. What if... What if? What if I wasn't planning all this? Hey, great improv. It's, it's, uh, I'm just playing Tetris. Yeah, but with <laughs> massive stories and things that are out of your control. <laughs> but what if the moons? I, I'm imagining you walking, like, in the middle of the night one day, being like, just like getting stuck outside of your refrigerator. No. What if the moons were in the umbral? <laughs> okay. Um, speaking of the umbral, uh, also, yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, you. No, you. <laughs> Is there an ocean in the umbral? I, I I believe so. I think okay. that ocean is closer to the primordial ages ocean. Uh-huh. So for those who haven't watched or who, have, who don't know, uh, there are two. So like the the way that this kind of works, and I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm going to attempt to describe this, and then you're gonna make it correct. Um, <laughs> Like in the regular Forgotten Realms, uh, there are two kind of uh, parallel planes to the existing uh, prime material. Mm-hmm. The Feywild, or the, what do you call it? The Wild. The Wild. With a E at the end of Wild. The Oscar Wild. Um, and then the Umbral. And Fey is spelled with an A, not an E. A Fey. Like, yep. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the Wild. The <laughs> Wild. 
<laughs> and the umbral. <laughs> and there, the, you, you can Where's get the umbral. The umbral uh, is a, a amalgamation of the, uh, the the shadow fey or the under, or not the underdark, uh, the shadow dark. Um, shadow dark. Yeah, the the great RPG system. Uh, they were getting way off track. <laughs> <laughs> and you can light a candle to either. Yeah. Uh, there is a blue candle, which we saw in... Haunting. <laughs> the Haunting of Ruby Minis. I was fucking with you on that one. Uh, <laughs> which you saw... I need shorter titles. <laughs> in the Haunting of Ruby Minis. Um, we saw that. And then there's another candle, which I believe is a... Green flame. Green flame. Which you... are... Uh, typically owned by hags. Right. Um, so with that, we discovered that like there are things like that. So I'd be curious to see, like, again, can these flames exist underwater? Is there a possibility that like if we had gone to that site with an umbral candle, lit it underwater, like what would we have seen? Mm -hmm. Was that what they were trying to do with those like little balls that you see at the end of the Curse, or Curse of Amity of like trying to break the umbral connection or something like that? Well, we also know there the astral sea exists. Yes, it is Bryn went there. It is a space beyond place and time. Right. Can you be underwater in the astral sea? The astral sea... There is no water in the Astral Sea. Hell yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah. Yeah. It, it would have been interesting if we had umbral candles or fey candles. Yeah. Um, yeah. It'd be wild. It was my, it was my headcanon for a little bit when you just started to describe them that like the reason that the, um, the, the Swagen had chosen the lighthouse mm -hmm. and the broken lighthouse is the one was because in the umbral they were going to light it and make a giant like beacon uh that's not not true yeah uh because it's completely possible in the umbral it might still be a standing lighthouse yeah um yeah yeah with a crashing stormy sea that's yeah. always there the sea, she is a cruel mistress. Mm -hmm. I will say that. Um, we got way off track. <laughs> we're back to the ocean. We're, we're back, on track again. We're back on track. Um, is there any sort of... Uh, obviously, in Second Dawn, where we were right now, there's really only you know very basic sailing vessels and stuff like that. The largest sailing vessels are... There are three of them. Well, now two of them. Now two. Thanks, Bryn. They are massive. <laughs> They are the size of a football stadium. They are war vessels. And then there's just, we, we got our ship that we had. The Astern Martingale. And then we have some dinghies and s s uh, skippers, no, skids. Swoops. Swoops. We have swoops. So we have small, mediums, and large. Mm -hmm. And the larges are the rarer ones because you need a lot of money mm -hmm. and a lot of influence and a lot of motivation to have them. And a lot of people. And a lot of people. Yeah. So they're military vessels. Yeah. So with that in like, th there were these three military vessels that uh, one of which was stormed, st stolen by uh, Jormund. Which we learned. Which we learned, which was a wild moment for me. Uh, that we're just like, hey, there's this thing. That happened. It's just the news on the posting board. Yeah. <laughs> Crazy. This just in. <laughs> this just in. This man <laughs> has will be stolen a ship. <laughs> <laughs> he was lying. He was he was in the console, and now he's run. He's committed murder. Yeah. It, it, like, why were those ships commissioned? Like, do you have a reason why? Mm -hmm. Like, there's three big warring vessels. Oh yeah. Are you gonna are you gonna tell me? Well, we are talking about the ocean. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, one was commissioned for uh, Martima. One was commissioned for Tarka, and one was missioned for Braymore. Uh, the Martinma was stolen. And that was that. <laughs> so, uh, which also says he had to have a massive crew. Yeah. That were just loyal to him. Yeah. Uh, well, he was a person in power. Yeah. And he stayed in the trading sea because he would have to sail by Tarka, who had another war vessel. Mm. Um, and then he got trapped on Amity. So, in essence, those those 
fleet that fleet of ships was made to be a blockade to any they, sort of person who tried to so early second dawn this only exists because i really want to make this game happen and i just need the funding it, it would first. be a massive adventure and a massive undertaking because i'd be making so much shit. but saving prince ryan saving prince ryan <laughs> <laughs> it, uh huh. It's a war between Martma, Tarka, Braymore against Iron's Edge. That's why Iron's Edge is now called New Iron's Edge. Mmm. Because Iron's Edge kind of went the route of 1920s Germany. And they have a lot of land. Mm hmm. They have a whole side of the continent to themselves. Uh, they have access to the Giant's Pass, which allows them to cross into the Frozen Waste. They're... Toss a stone away from Drakelheim. They are uh, not that far from where Loam used to be. It's a massive possible powerhouse. And so, like, they made those ships to attack Iron's Edge. Mm. Um, and that's how you kind of get, like, the big Normandy opening to that adventure that I want to play is mm -hmm. those ships existed solely to put an end to what Iron's Edge is essentially built off the original concept of Thay and the Red Wizards. Ooh, fun. So it was a dark place. Like a dark mageocracy. Yeah. New Iron's Edge is like, hey guys, certain things are outlawed. <laughs> so the shit doesn't happen again, which is what Germany does. Yeah. Um, so those ships were built for that. Mm. God, I want that game so bad now. <laughs> it's, it's literally Saving Private Ryan D and D. Yeah, Saving starting, Private Ryan. Starting based off on the beach. That's wild. Yeah, that would that would be yeah. So like, especially from that. And they're time, not using they're not using turrets. They're using arrows. <laughs> Fireballs. <laughs> oh. Fucking magic missiles magic shooting from the mi beach. Oh my god and. You literally cannot. And your soldiers you can't running onto the beach, <laughs> yeah. taking fireball attacks and magic missiles, which cannot miss. Mm -hmm. God, and the people casting shields, and you, you're. Oh man, I want it so bad now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the, if there was a time to run uh, MCDM uh, strongholds and followers and kingdoms and warfares, is saving Prince Ryan. Saving Prince Ryan. <laughs> yeah. What do you do as this army moves across the land? <laughs> yeah. And the whole mission, I love the title, Saving Prince Ryan. You got to go save the prince. Yeah. Which is the most noble act. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you could even fold it into Saving Private Ryan too of like like saving like, an individual because of mom. Well, saving not even not even that, but like hey, this is the last prince like in kind of the it's the cats uh, <laughs> Holy shit. no it's not oh she just left the window open the oh oh that's a window by the way everybody <laughs> <laughs> um yeah like the the in the same way that like early like noble families were like there's 14 kids it's like all the other princes are dead this guy is next in line to be king if i was to play that route i would say prince ryan is the last elf of Iron Edge. Ooh. In during Second Dawn. There you go. He's an elf. Gotta go in and save him. Yeah. And so you have orcs and goliaths, you have dwarves, they're all attacking the beach, mm. humans, uh, halflings, gnomes, half elves, they're all attacking against what is just endless wizards. Yeah. Ugh. And whatever wizards wanna make. This is so cool. Wow. <laughs> Why are we doing anything else? <laughs> we got to do Dante's Peak. Ugh. And then we got to do uh, Day After Tomorrow. We got to do Twist. Day After Tomorrow? <laughs> Day After Tomorrow, okay. Dante's Peak, Dracula, Cocaine Bear. Sorry, Cocaine Owl Bear. <laughs> I thought that you said, sorry, I didn't mean to not say cocaine. I meant to say owl bear. <laughs> we got to do all these adventures before we can do Saving Prince Ryan. Cool. But it's only going to happen if we have enough patrons and uh, backers. Hey, you know, I, I sincerely hope that people find it in their hearts to make this a reality. And we also um, got to do the mummy. That's true. We got the we mummy. Got, we have, so we, we're we spending a lot of time in Westlands. Yeah. We got to get going to the Eastlands and Southlands. Yeah. 
Southlands is literally twice the size of the Westlands. Yeah. <laughs> and like, and again, like it's all, all of these can be connected to the ocean in some way. We can have some, like, there there's the, even... there's the, the, uh, not the trade, not the trade and see the, uh, the Eastern sea. There is the, is it, that's not the spice sea. The, uh, the spicy, the spicy. <laughs> I mean, it's right. very, it's very caliente. That spicy. So the names of all the seas. All the seas. We have the Bucanawa Sea okay. to the west. Above that, that's the Caped Sea that uh, and during the winter becomes the Frozen Sea. Mm. We have the just broadly spoken Western Sea, which is south of Bucanawa, but west of the Trading Sea. Mm -hmm. South of the Western Sea is Umberley Sea. And then there's the Hook Islands. Uh, you can imagine what movie we'll play when we go down there. Hook. <laughs> uh, then we have the Shoka Passage. We have Cape of Golden Dreams, the Southern Sea, the Corsair Coast, the Spice Coast, uh, the Free Islands, the Eastern Sea, the White Sea, which during the winter is just ice, ice, the Northern Sea, and then the Frozen Sea, which is north of the White Sea, which also just becomes ice. Hmm. And those are the names of the seas. Those are the names of the seas. There's a lot of lakes in here, too. <laughs> I am imagining in the Hook Islands that there, uh, there is a, there's a little cottage on a hill with a young man who never grows old, and no one knows why, and locked in a fairy cabinet in a weird place is a green candle. <laughs> Maybe. Yep. Oh. What is there anything else you'd like to discuss about, about the sea? About the sea before we before we wrap this up there, Deuterino. Well, there's I like we talked about a lot, and there's not a lot of things like locked in as much as we did dwarves. Right. And it's because you know we sailed over the trading sea for like a couple days, mm -hmm. and we're on an island, and we're covering the best ground that's needed for the story of that adventure. Right. Um, a lot of this stuff is texture and world building aspects. So that way, when we pick a movie, ooh, spooky. When we pick a movie to base an adventure off of, we have a better foundation on how to adapt that to the world. Mm -hmm. How do we take this plot from this movie with its themes and some of its iconic uh, moments or not moments as much as like, because those are pre-written. I would say setups. The concepts conceived in the film. Yeah, and obstacles. And how can we f put them into the world smoothly? And what about the world evolves in the world building to allow it to happen, right? Mm. But we need to know, like, w what's in the sea? It's the Bucanawa Sea. Okay. So this, this is what's happening in the Bucanawa Sea. Great. And now this event is happening. Cool. It can be isolated for the sake of the adventure, but the moment you guys go off track out of your choice, I know what's going on around you. Mm -hmm. And I know how what can influence as you guys go in this, and now it's becoming its own thing. And the thing that like you always run into at sea stuff is that a lot of times the crux of the story just happens to be getting out of it. Like the Poseidon Adventure, the Abyss, like it's all escape rooms. It's all escape rooms. Like yeah. the only the only movie, and I'm I hate that I'm mentioning this in this podcast. The only movie that really doesn't deal with the concept of the, of the sea, other than it being a partial partial area of it, is Avatar Two. Because oh, the yeah. story happens around the ocean. Yeah, there's a lot of good influences from the Avatar way of water that you can get a vibe of Water Genasi. Yeah. Because it's a good, just like, original idea of like, here's some fantasy islanders and ocean people. Mm -hmm. And there's some just like cool vibes and concepts and world building that's going on that like, just like anyone should pull from Lord of the Rings. Right. Pull from this. It's great. It's, it's freaking gorgeous. Yeah. <laughs> and it's profitable and brilliant and everyone knows what it is. Yeah. So. Yeah. 
the, the way the water thing that with the what waters and us and then we can wrap up after this is i like the idea that they inherently just made fun of people who didn't know how to swim it's great it was just such a like like what do you mean how do you how can you not walk like how can yeah. you not do that unless you were broken yeah why can't you walk yeah which is great I just, would imagine Earth Genasi say the same thing. Oh, of course. What do you mean you can't walk? What do you mean you can't walk through solid rock? Come on. Come fire on. Uh, fire Genasi, like... Never get cold. Never get cold. I always thought they, they would probably live in the tundra because of that. Yeah. Versus, like, they're always in the desert. I was like, yeah, they probably are. But, you know, the desert is probably full of, uh, surprisingly... Freshwater Genasi. Oh, for oases. Uh huh. Um, there's air Genasi and earth Genasi in the desert. And I was like, well, if fire is there, they all four of those would find a way to live in the tundra too. True. Like, it's all happened. <laughs> Lizards, all of it happens. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's pretty great. I don't know where I you was. You know going what we didn't talk about? <laughs> what? How there are some Shawagans with four arms and some Shawagans <laughs> that are. Uh, cultist leaders. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Like yes. priestess and champions. We didn't talk about that. Which is the all. most developed of the That's ocean. True. We have to talk about that. <laughs> We're really good at this. Uh, Let's dive into that. Yeah, champions. Uh, they're chosen by their shaman priestesses. So Shamadi was super manipulated. He, yeah. He yeah. Because he was, he was believing in the sharks. Yeah. She was believing in the yellow king. Right. But she had the influence and know how to go like, cool, I can put you in power. You'll do my bidding. But it's a common cultural thing. Like you pick the strongest uh, warrior, you make them the champion to lead the people. Mm. And then you are the spiritual leader. But yeah, so the priestess Shwagan would choose a, ch a warrior to be the champion. Okay. The priestess is a mix of a druidic cleric. They're very much a chaos cleric. They are very much like a little bit of the four seers. They uh, help guide the champion into leading uh, the, their clan to the best place. Mm -hmm. um, the champions are typically malevolent because of the culture around Shawagans. But that doesn't mean they are vicious killers or vicious evil people. Like Shahan Madi was vicious and evil. Like, he brought Ellen back to make into a slave. That was Sean Madi? I thought that was the priestess. Well, Sean Madi demanded that uh, Ellen would be used for something later. Ah, right. Yeah, so there is a very, like, I, I kind of made a very simple relationship because I was like, oh, the Shawagan are like just scattered clans of destruction and raiding. And then... I was like, well, who would lead these? Like, the strongest one. Yeah. But how would you choose the strongest one? The witchcraft, like, priestess. That's what made sense to me. Uh, and then also building off of, like, what minis do I have for these monsters? Mm -hmm. And those minis exist because of Wizards of the Coast lore. So it's like, okay, I'm just going to go there, start there, get to an end point, and then work my way back to, like, clear it up. Are you, if you ever watched uh, Star Wars Clone Wars? The original cartoon? The not the Gary Tarkovsky one, then the one that the show, the bigger show, the bigger show. No, there is, and I'm I'm hoping I can draw a parallel here. Uh, there is a they kind of expanded the the Dathomir storyline. The, the green one, the green one, the the green Jedi with the no the squid Dathomir is like uh, Darth Maul. Uh, the Witches of Dathomir. Oh, the seen. devilish, uh, yeah. tiefling-looking guys. Sort of. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's a part of that where the Witches of Dathomir uh, bring back, and this is why Darth Maul is in all the new stuff, because uh, he, he never died. He kind of went crazy, and so they send his brother after him. Mm -hmm. and kind I know of, this one, yeah. Yeah, Savage Opress is his name. And it's, I'm drawing a parallel between, like, the Priestess Shwagan and the, the, the Shamadi and everything because uh, Mother Talson, who is the Priestess Shwagan analogy, 
basically goes like, you need to find your brother, but you need to be strong. And so they basically just perform this ceremony on him where he just gets jacked. <laughs> and then they're like, cool, you have abilities now. Go get it. Go get him. But he is wholly just a regular guy. Mm -hmm. Is that kind of what happened to Sean Medib, or Or was he a good warrior that was just also augmented by magic? He was augmented by magic. So the two armed originally. Yeah. And then to be chosen for a champion you gotta go through the trial mm -hmm. um the same trial we went through no oh well that trial yeah i thought of a different trial <laughs> yeah the same trial <laughs> okay where you have to fight sharks your god yeah and learn to dominate them what what a, what does a culture say when their trials into becoming the leader is you besting your god Crazy. Narcissism. Yeah. Look at how you you met him. Yeah, he was sitting on a throne surrounded by interns. interns and he <laughs> supposedly <laughs> eating an intern. Supposedly. Yeah. Um, Damn interns. So typically in a in a regular Sawagan camp, yeah. the priestess also prays to Sekula. To a shark god, yeah. And is just like, hey, we're doing shark stuff. We're doing shark stuff and we Keep moving and keep killing because that's what sharks do. And their blood, their bl they have yeah. blood frenzy as a mechanic. Mm -hmm. So it's like, oh, that mechanic should say something about them as people or a creature. Because they're, yes, they are a people, but they're not a playable ancestry that we're going to, they are, they are. They're monsters. They're, there are people out there on the internet that are like, oh, screw monstrous people. Like, well, they're not monstrous people. They are the book. They are one of many boogeymen. They are boogie people. They are monsters that rather than saying monsters who can wear clothes and clearly think for themselves right. are horrible. They are built off of factions that are built off of cultures and traditions that are very destructive. Mm -hmm. And because it's a fantasy place, because they are not human, mm -hmm. they are made of literally a thing that we're terrified in the real world of. Yeah. Everyone's a terrified thing of, right? Like yeah. they eat everything. And you could even- They're carnivorous. They're carnivorous. <laughs> and you could even pull it a step back and go like, yeah, Sekula made these people to spread their will of destruction. In Forgotten Realms, yeah. But, but I'm saying in this world too, you could also say like, if someone were to come at you and be like, why are all these people bad? It's like, well, this person sent them there to cause destruction. They that worship a, a very chaotic thing. Yeah. They're chaos clerics. Yeah. I, I keep wanting to say like I did in the game, Sean Mendes. Sean Mendes. Sean Mendes. Yeah. We kind of covered what has been developed so far. Mm -hmm. And the more we played different adventures, uh, around coastal areas or at sea, the more it invites development mm -hmm. and more discovery. From our table to your screen, uh, like the sands of time through an hourglass. <laughs> <laughs> I was listening. The water is scary. Well, it looks like that's all the time that we have here for lore of Ada. My name's Chris. Uh, hey, listen, if you got any more burning questions that you want answered, just put them down in the comment section below. I will dig through them like sand or silt in the water and pull out the gems from which, and I will share them with my co-host here, David, and we will answer them. Or my name isn't Davy Jones. Nope, my name is Chris Scovira. Have a great day. Bye. Thanks again, Chris. Hey, you're welcome. You're amazing. Hey, thanks. Hey, you're amazing. We're still recording. <laughs> <laughs> Bukinawa ate the moons, and that's why they're in the umbral. And so, like, I was, we were speculating. I think it's, hey, don't fat shame Bukinawa. <laughs> I'm trying to think of a good coming in line. Splish splash, I want to take a bath. <laughs> I was thinking that too. <laughs> <laughs> les poissons, les poissons. <laughs> Hi, welcome back to Fables of Erda. My name's Chris. We're talking lore here on Erda. Ha <laughs> ha!